What is the difference between uh, polygamy and adultery? Well, perhaps the behavior of Joseph Smith can help answer that question tonight on polygamy. What love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, all of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me, and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. I am your host, Doris Hansen, and we do hope that you enjoy your time with us tonight. I thought I would mention right off that uh, two weeks ago there was a glitch in the system here at TV20 Studio, and our show was not broadcast. And we want to thank the many people who uh, registered concern for our safety and, and for our welfare. And we'd like to assure all of you who contacted us one way or another, uh, whether you're our friend or our foe, that we are safe and to answer the many questions um, from the people who wondered what happened, we are fine and no one has shut us down. Um, also, before we get started with the show, we would like our viewers to know that we're still helping the woman uh, from the FLDS church who needed a home and she's finally got into some housing and now she needs some furniture and furnishings. If you or someone that you know has any household items or furniture that you would like to donate to her, you would give us a call. We would sure appreciate it. Our telephone number to call would be 801-649-3103. 801-649-3103, or you can email me, Doris at about, or shieldandrefuge.org, sorry, Doris at shieldandrefuge.org. If you've got furniture or furnishings that you could donate for this woman, uh, we would sure appreciate it, and we can also give you donation receipt if you would like it. Uh, we do have a very interesting show planned for you tonight, and so we want to introduce our guest and plunge into our conversation. Our guest tonight served in the educational system of the LDS Church for 34 years. He uh, finished his master's degree in 1967, and he taught full-time religious classes, religion classes in New Zealand. He was institute director at Whittier College and later at Butte College. He taught seminary classes in high school in Salt Lake City. And during 1985 and 1986, he was placed on probation for telling historical truth about the translation process used by Joseph Smith. He has done a lot of research about the Book of Mormon, but has found no positive answers to the problems of the Book of Mormon. He published a book about his conclusions entitled An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, published by Signature Book. And he also published in 2005 another book entitled The Incomparable Jesus, published by Colford Books. He has also penned articles for the Salt Lake Tribune, Sunstone Magazine, the John Whitmer Journal, and the Midwestern Journal of Theology. We would like to introduce and welcome our guest tonight, Grant Palmer. Thank you for coming and being our guest tonight. Thank you for having me, Doris. <laughs> You've got lots, lots of good stuff to talk about. You've written some interesting and controversial papers, which 
Uh, now, your books have been, these two books have been published, but your papers haven't been and yet. They're on your website, but they haven't been officially published yet. But we're going to talk about two of those papers. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about, um, I think it's entitled, Joseph Smith committed, did Joseph Smith commit treason in his quest for political empire in 1844? And then tonight, we're going to talk about the sexual allegations against Joseph Smith. So before we get started, would you like to uh, tell our viewers about your books and where our, where our viewers can get your books and, and maybe your website and contact information? Uh, the best place to get an incomparable Jesus or, uh, or an insider's view of Mormon origins is probably Amazon.com. That's where I'd recommend that you go to. As far as uh, insider's view, uh, I put together a brief outline, two and a quarter pages. If anyone would like a copy of that outline of, of the insider's view, I'd be happy to send it to you if you would... Uh, uh, email me at the, my email address, which is, which is on the air. It's grantHPalmer at gmail.com, correct? Yes. GrantHPalmer at gmail.com. If any of them are interested in your papers and more information, plus you have a website that um, they can get information on. I do. That's uh, set up for me at mormonthink.com and the specifics you have them yeah slash grant palmer dot hpm and that's there also on uh, the screen for you so you can find information and also um, we have our email address tv at about polygamy dot com for anyone who maybe didn't get this information you can email us and i'll be happy to forward the information off to you tonight i think it's important because of our discussion to remind our viewers of our disclaimer as we discuss issues on our show, we are dealing with both polygamous and Mormon doctrine, and polygamous use the same standard works uh, that the LDS use. They believe and they teach the same um, foundational doctrines as the mainline Mormon church believes and teaches. In fact, Joseph Smith belongs to the polygamous as much or more than he does to the mainstream church because they follow Joseph Smith's teachings more closely than the mainstream LDS church does. If the Mormon fundamentalists are wrong, then the original Mormon church was also wrong. And if the original Mormon church was wrong, the current Mormon church is wrong. Both the polygamous and the present day LDS church cannot both be right, but they can both be wrong. And that's our disclaimer for those who, who wonder why we bring Mormonism into this, because there is a link and there is a definite connection and we're going to be talking about that tonight. So we're going to talk about your paper, The Sexual Allegations Against Joseph Smith. Now, we all know that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. But there's, there's a few people that actually know that he was accused of sexual misconduct between, uh, what, 1829 and 1835, before the church was even officially formed. Well, it starts right about the time he's married in 1827. And the, the allegations start coming uh, thick and fast. Uh, between that and in 1838, 11 years, Joseph Smith is, is accused by uh, nine different females, uh, usually not directly by the females themselves, but usually family members that are, that are associated with these females are, are making the charges. And their sexual allegations that yeah, Joseph they're Smith... Unwanted, uh, uh, sexual advances towards them, <clears throat> and they don't uh, they don't appreciate them. Yeah, they don't. And so they they complain about it. So almost as soon as he's married, beginning with Eliza Winters, which was Emma's friend in Harmony, Pennsylvania, uh, is the first of them. And then they clear down until November, December of '43, when Joseph uh, propositions Jane Law, William. Law's wife, who's a member of the First Presidency of the Church, mm -hmm. and uh, but of course there's there's many more than nine. It's just from 27 to 38, there's nine, and then he shifts into high gear, and you have all oh, 33 women who say I do to his proposals, mm -hmm. and we know at least seven that turned him down, and there may be more who turned him down. So in a 28-month mm -hmm. period in Nauvoo. He, uh, he's, he's, at, he's been successful in getting 33 uh, females to, to accept his marriage proposals. There's about 11 teenagers, mm -hmm. 
there's uh, uh, 11 married women right. and another 11 uh, single women over age 19. So he's, he's pretty busy. This is about one every, more than one a month. His first uh, polygamous wife was Louisa Beeman in uh, April of 41. And like I say, the last attempt was on Jane Law in November or December of 43. So that during that 28-month period, he's, he's finding about one, more than one a month that will mm -hmm. say yes. Yeah, that's true. Now, on uh, some of the, the uh, women that you've documented in your paper, and this is a paper that you are going to, that is going to be published. When is it going to be published? Uh, the William and Jane Law paper, it's three reasons why William and Jane Law left the LDS Church. They, uh, probably the highest ranking member to ever leave the LDS Church, <clears throat> member of the First Presidency, had a good reputation, was regarded as a very honest person before Mormonism, during, and after. After he left Mormonism, he uh, became a physician for 40 years up in Apple Valley, uh, Illinois, and up in Schulzburg, uh, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And then the allegations paper is going to be published. Uh, I haven't submitted that one. So you don't uh, have the, a date on but that But the, the William and Jane Law paper will be published in September uh -huh. in the John Whitmer Journal. Okay. And we'll be talking about that and a little bit more about the Jane Law. But first, let's, let's talk about some of these women that he, um, that he pursued. The Stoll sisters, Miriam and, and Rhoda Stoll? We don't have much on that. The only information we have comes from the LDS church history. Mm -hmm. We don't have the other side of the argument. But it really begins with Eliza Winter. This is Emma's friend. She's 16 years old. Her cousin Levi Lewis and later Hyle Lewis uh, say that uh, they've accused her, accused Joseph Smith of untoward advances, sexual advances towards, towards uh, uh, Eliza Winters. Once again, we don't have Eliza Winters' statements. So when Joseph goes to to, to two court trials in 1830, uh, they probably heard rumors about the Eliza Winter case, and so they asked Miriam and Rhoda Stoll. Uh, Joseph worked with their father trying to find a silver mine in 1825, and they put them on the stand just finding out what his behavior has been towards them. This is in now 28, 29. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it looks to me like they're just on a fishing expedition. But like I say, we only have one side of that argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have much evidence on them at all. Yeah, and the, but they were young girls. They were um, 18 and 20. Yes. And Eliza Winters was 16 yes. when this allegedly happened. Um, I believe in your paper you mentioned that um, he was, Levi Lewis said that um, Joseph Smith allegedly said that he heard Joseph Smith and Martin Harris say that they did not believe that adultery was a crime. Yes, that's what you have. Uh, I don't uh, know how strong of evidence that is, but that's yeah. what they're saying during that period of time, early on, 1834, I think they published some Perhaps material. Perhaps the behavior proves that. But uh, you, have a, you have kind of a pattern here. Wherever Joseph Smith goes, he gets these allegations against him. They're in Harmony, Pennsylvania. They're in, they're in uh, Bainbridge, New York. When he goes to Ohio, we'll see that he's got mm -hmm. a number there. He gets them in Missouri. And so it just kind of follows him around. And I, all I would say is that uh, you have, in a, in a ten, nine, ten-year period, you have Joseph Smith being accused by nine different females or, or people on their behalf, uh, nine, nine different females in four or five different states. And I know as, a, as a, a man, I would be mortified if I had that kind of accusation against me. Is there any, anyone in our viewing audience who knows anyone who's had nine sexual allegations against uh, their character? In a in a yeah, in eleven year a, period, I think they have a, an official list now, don't they? Where people who <laughs> they know who the eleven yes they know. They are. And, I mean, it's it's kind of a, it. it you, you don't know what to make of it. It's just it's it's such a, a and the apologists, the LDS apologists, are saying, oh, it's all smoke. Yeah, all nine yeah. of these, there's nothing to it, and my research would indicate there's some smoke. 
But there's also some fire well, in there. Where there's smoke, there's generally fire. Uh, you talk in your paper about um, in 1832 in Hiram, Ohio, uh, at John Johnson's home, the mob and Dr. Dennison and um, the tar and feather ins instance because of Nancy Johnson. Yes, Nancy Miranda Johnson. She's, she's John Johnson's daughter. She lives there. The Smiths are there. And uh, I think the best report comes from her brother, Luke Johnson, who's later one of the 12 apostles, the first quorum of 12 apostles. Hmm. And he wasn't home at the time, so he's getting this from his father, John Johnson. Mm -hmm. But he talks about what's going on, and the accusations are by John's brother, Eli. And the foremost uh, complaint is that uh, Eli's upset because Joseph Smith is trying to commandeer his property into this law of consecration, all things in common. The, the United Order. Yeah, the we United, were raised in one of those. Yes, you know about those. <laughs> you betcha I do. <laughs> the other accusation is that Eli thought he was being way too friendly with Nancy, and so they decided to do something about it. They did it in the middle of the night. I don't know if they got their nerve up because they'd been drinking, but it could be a crime of passion. In the middle of the night, you'd think the property thing could have waited till the next morning. Yeah. But in the middle of the night, they, they get this Dr. Dennison, who's a doctor, and he was planning on castrating Joseph Smith for these allegations. Mm -hmm. And when he sees Joseph stretched out on a board and naked, he changes his heart. Mm -hmm. But the question is, why would they bring along Dr. Dennison? And so that's one of the flags that go up. Mm -hmm. Why would they have him specifically there to castrate him? And that is coming from Luke Johnson, the brother of Nancy, who's sympathetic to the Mormon faith. An apostle. The apostle, actually. Well, later, he's not right? an apostle yet. But he, he later would have been in 35. One. He would have been a member of the... And also his brother, Lyman Johnson, mm -hmm. were two of the original 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. the and Nancy Church. Marinda later became a plural wife of Joseph Smith, she, too. Yeah, so. She married Hyde, Orison Hyde, and then later... Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. So there's one of those incidents where I think there might be some fire in that that story. But again, Nancy never comes forward and says he did this, he did that. And mm -hmm. so we have to leave it in the category as a historian of an allegation. Mm -hmm. But even and even at that, and we were talking about this just before the show, because they didn't come forward, we wonder. If, if maybe it could have been because, like he did with so many of the other women that he would propose, and, and if they said no, he threatened to ruin their reputation. So perhaps he threatened them, and that's why they didn't come forward. Maybe they were too young. Maybe they didn't think they'd be believed. And well, if, if the allegations of the nine females would have ended before Nauvoo, you might be able to give Joseph Smith more benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But he carries on the same tactics yeah. uh, with women in Nauvoo. And so you begin to see a pattern of his personality and his character here. And I think that's what I would try to establish tonight to let the viewer judge for themselves. Sure. But this pattern is, is pervasive throughout his married life. Like I say, it begins with Eliza Winter and ends with Jane Law mm -hmm. after 30 or after 28 months. Mm -hmm. What about the... Um, the, of course, we, we see the involvement of Joseph Smith's uh, theology and so on as time goes on. And even with his polygamy, we wonder if when he penned Section 132, the, the revelation on polygamy, um, or when he claimed that he received that revelation, the, the, these, it, it, was it a, a, a maybe surrounding him with protection when he said, thus saith the Lord? You know, because maybe they wouldn't attack him if they thought... If he thought maybe the Lord told him he could do this and they would leave him alone. Well, that revelation is received July 12th, 1843, as I recall. That's when it was written down, but he said he received it 10 years earlier than that, or 11 now, years earlier. We need to address that. But there, uh, by the time it was written down, he already had 21 right, wives. Right, right. 
Now you're referring to an 1831. Well, I'm I'm referring that. Uh, well, he was living polygamy before the 1843, before he wrote it down. Yeah. So he said that God gave him that secretly, and he secretly lived it before he wrote it down we in 1843. We don't have any revelation for the church. That's right. It's just. But he was living he's, it before he's that. He's approaching uh, Louisa Beeman in in April of 41. Uh, I think Several she others. was 38, wasn't she? Wasn't no, Louisa she's Beeman the first 38? one in 41, but April of 41. But Fanny Alger is mentioned as well, being a wife a lot of the, by the Mormon Church. A lot church. of uh, researchers think that she was married in 33. Yeah. But this yeah. goes back to 1831. I think we need to talk about that for a moment because mm -hmm. in 1831, Joseph Smith and Ezra Booth and Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris and W.W. W. Phelps and... A couple of others go down to, to Jackson County, Missouri, for the purpose of preaching to the Lamanites. Mm -hmm. And they can't get on the reservations because they don't have a government license. The other way to get on there is to bring some goods and kind of bribe your way in there to say, well, we're going to give this to the Indians. They didn't have goods and they didn't have a license. So Joseph Smith has a revelation, and he says right there in 1831 that the elders that are single in the church, if they will marry a Lamanite, then they can, they can uh, get on the reservation anytime they want because they're family. <laughs> now, this revelation was never written down by Joseph Smith, and it was never talked about by Joseph Smith other than this one occasion. Now, Ezra Booth is one of those men that was with Joseph and heard this revelation, and he came home, fell away, and wrote a series of letters to an Ohio newspaper, I think nine, eight or nine, to a Reverend uh, Eddie, and he lays out just what I told you. Mm -hmm. This is for single elders. If they will marry the Lamanites, we can get on the reservation and they will be blessed greatly. There's not a word in there about polygamy. And I, and I would say that Ezra Booth became quite anti-Mormon. And when he published these letters, the last one in December 31, so this is contemporary, mm -hmm. uh, it just makes sense to me logically that if Joseph Smith had mentioned polygamy in that revelation in 1831 that Ezra Booth would have jumped all over it and mentioned that in his letter to the Reverend Eddie. But he does not. And I don't think it's about polygamy. As section 132, the introduction says that polygamy was introduced or talked about or a revelation was received in 1831. Mm -hmm. One more thing is relevant. 30 years later, 1861, William W. Phelps, he was one of those missionaries. He decides to write it down, literally 30 years wow. later. And now he's saying, oh, that revelation was for, for married men as well yeah. to marry the Lamanites. Uh -huh. and, and that's how they're going to become white and delightsome. Yeah. Three years later, I had a private conversation with Joseph, and he said, well, that's how they'll become white and delightsome is by married elders marrying them. Well, is that constitute a revelation to usher in polygamy? I don't think so, especially when Ezra Booth is writing it right at the time it happened. He had every reason to, if there was polygamy, to talk about it because he knew that would bring uh, discredit to the church, but he doesn't say a word. I'm inclined mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. with, with uh, Ezra Booth on that one and not William W. Phelps. But the inclination, the, his inclination, even at that, from from his first allegation clear until his death, Polygamy's on is, his mind all the way through. He, I he think. likes the women. I yes. mean, he just goes after them, and, and if he has to say, Thus saith the Lord, to make it easier for him, he will. But they use that as, a, as an introduction to Section 132. Right. I think exactly. it's unjustified. Yeah. And there's not a revelation for the church until section 132. And it really didn't even become a, a official doctrine until 1852 when, right, when Orson when first Pratt start talking uh, about preached it. about it. But they use that 31. Some of the apologists use this 
1831 polygamy revelation, which it is not, mm -hmm. to justify that Fanny Alger was Joseph Smith's Ex first That's right. That's what I wanted wife. to bring up. Right. Yeah. But, but there, there's no indication that she was an actual plural wife, only an adulterous affair, but... Well, there's, there's no uh, marriage license. Right. Uh, we, some of the scholars think she was married in 33 to 35. This is before the sealing power of Elijah is given in section, uh, what is it, 110, where Elijah comes and reveals mm -hmm. the power to seal and loose and bind and unbind. Yeah. So if he's marrying her, he, he doesn't have the sealing power to do it in polygamy. What's strange about this incident is that she then quickly leaves uh, leaves Ohio, goes to Indiana, marries a, a non-LDS guy named Custer. That's mm -hmm. a very strange behavior for a plural wife. Uh, I just don't see that this is a plural wife, and, and I'd say for two reasons, I, and here I think there's some fire, mm -hmm. for two reasons. Oliver Cowdery says he was told about the Fanny Alger incident by Joseph himself, and he says that Joseph told me about it, had confessed to Emma, and was seeking her forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think Oliver Cowdery was a liar, but maybe some of our audience do. But that doesn't sound like a polygamous marriage. That sounds like a, uh, an act of adultery. In mm -hmm. fact, Emma Smith actually, in 1847, 46, 47, she would talk about polygamy. After that, she clammed right up, wouldn't even tell her children about it. But those two years, she begins to talk about uh, Joseph Smith and polygamy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Emma says, says right in the documents that my husband, the prophet Joseph Smith, practiced both adultery and polygamy. And I think she has in mind, at least for one example, uh, Fanny Alger, because she caught them in the barn. She, caught, she saw them. She saw mm -hmm. them. And then you have Oliver Cowdery. That strikes me as a little more evidentiary than some of the other allegations. But they like to spin it, the LDS apologists, that this is his first plural wife, mm -hmm. and I don't think they've got very good evidence to support well, that. Well, I think they have to call her his first plural wife because if not, then he's committing adultery and they can't have his prophet well, that's committing what his adultery. Wife says. Yeah. He committed both. She distinguishes between adultery and... and a, right. And the, she, yeah. She's not just calling polygamy adultery. She's saying mm -hmm. there was polygamy and then there was adultery. Right. And now, and of course, Oliver Cowdery, again, he called it a dirty, nasty, filthy affair. Well, he's talking to, to David Patton. He's president of the Quorum of the Twelve. He's talking to his brother Warren. And then he's hauled up and second charge against Cowdery in 38 is that he's, he had uh, smeared the character of Joseph Smith. Well... It seems to me that while the LDS apologists like to say it's just all oh, it's all smoke and there's nothing to it, I think I think the the most likely two incidents of the nine are the Fanny Alger and maybe and maybe uh, the Nancy Nancy Johnson mm -hmm. case. Yeah, yeah. There were uh, there were others. Benjamin Johnson says there are two or three families that complained about the lewdness and licentious behavior of Joseph Smith in the Kirtland area. Yeah, yeah. So the allegations are there. They're, there's about one a year. They're in three different states in mm -hmm. 11 years. And I just, I'd be mortified if someone made that claim against me. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's very quickly talk about, um, we're going to be having our, our message in just a few minutes, um, halfway through the show. But William and Jane Law have a big part to, to play in some of this. Didn't didn't Emma tell Joseph at one time, if you're going to have plural wives, then give me the opportunity to have a plural husband? Well, and yeah. The, she approached... William and Jane Law. This is stuff you won't hear in the uh, LDS Sunday School, I assure you. But, uh, but uh, Joseph Smith, or William Law said, Joseph Smith told me personally that he sent Oren Porter Rockwell to assassinate Lyburn W. Boggs. Mm-hmm. Thomas Carlin, the sitting governor of Illinois, wrote Joseph a letter, and he says, you know, I didn't take your death threats against me personally until 
bog showed up with two bullets in his head and another two in his body. Mm -hmm. But I've, I'm watching you. And, I, I know, and you can't deny that you've made these prophecies because it's common knowledge. His, his, his counselor was Sidney Riggin. Riggin was sickly, so they appointed John C. Bennett to be assistant to the first presidency, and then William Law mm -hmm. for Rigdon, and then you have William Law, who's second counselor, and, uh, and, 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 and John Bennett says, when I was on good terms with Joseph in the presidency, uh, we all heard him speak there in the grove that he predicted that Boggs would die a violent death within a year. And sure enough, he did. Mm -hmm. And here you have William Law saying, Joseph told me personally he sent Rockwell to assassinate Boggs. And John C. Bennett also said at one point, where's Oren Rockwell? Gone, he said, quote, gone to fulfill prophecy, you hmm. see. Well. When, when, uh, when uh, Rockwell failed, he hired Joseph H. Jackson. We're going to hear more about him. There's mm -hmm. a book, three, 400 pages on him by one of our better historians. And Joseph worked on him to go, and he went to try to assassinate Boggs, but he wasn't at home. He came back and got the report. Joseph was very disappointed. It's quite a long story. But this is one of the reasons, one of the three major reasons that William and Jane Law left the church. Mm -hmm. And it's during the last two years of his life. And then in May of uh, 43, Joseph Smith's secretary, William Clayton, says that I heard this interesting conversation between Joseph and Emma. And it goes like this. And you can read it in this paper, which will be published in, in September. Uh, Joseph, if you can have all these wives, that's about when she discovered. Joseph never told her. Yeah. She discovered this. Right. And in May of 43, he had 21 wives, some of them married, some of them teenagers, and so forth. And he, she says to him, if you can do this with married women, I ought to have a sex partner, and I would like William Law, because he's such a sweet little man. And so... Joseph receives a revelation. It's embedded <laughs> in section 132, verse 51. Mm -hmm. And Joseph says, God commanded me to offer this to you, Emma. William Law. Okay. William Law says, what was the offer? He says, I want you to quit harassing me on polygamy. I want you to let six or seven of my wives live in the mansion house. And I want you to treat them well. That's the deal. Joseph and Emma agree. They approach the laws and they say, no way. Hmm. And William Law was asked, well, was this a wife swap deal? And he says, no, it was a substitute sex partner. My goodness. And, and so you have <laughs> a situation where uh, Emma wants William. And six months later, Joseph wants Jane for a plural wife. Mm -hmm. Joseph approaches Nancy Rigdon, the 17-year-old daughter of his first counselor, and John C. Bennett is running all over the place saying, Joseph says it's all right to have sex as long as we don't get caught. Yeah. Quite the first presidency in 1844. Yeah, Not a lot of Christianity in there. A lot, it was very, very strange. Well, um, one more comment before we open the phones. Well, jo I should say one more thing. Oh, okay. The third reason the laws left the church is that Joseph made himself king of the earth. And we'll be talking we'll about talk this that next, next week. Yeah. And he's a god. And the reason I think he thinks he's a god is because if you believe that he has the sealing power, then you do whatever he says. Mm -hmm. And he can seal or unseal. He can group seal. He can do anything he wants. And so he declares himself to be a god to this generation. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. You can read it right in the conference mm -hmm. report mm -hmm. of 1844 on, uh, I think it's the 7th of, uh, of April. And this just, th those three things push the laws push over the, the edge. edge. And they published the Nauvoo Expositor. And five days later, they've left Nauvoo and the church for good. And they don't want to talk about more. And they feel like they've been duped. And, and they it's were good people. They They're had a good, good reputation. And there was nothing wrong with, with uh, anything. He raised a good family. Yeah. One of them was a lawyer, another a doctor. 
But I think he was concerned about his 12-year-old daughter who was coming up, and uh, he could see what was going to happen polygamy-wise. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Um, again, one more comment before we open the phones. Joseph Smith said that God commanded polygamy, and yet we find no basis of truth for, his, um, for such a command. So if we look seriously at his sexually promiscuous behavior, or at least the allegations, and we know he had the, these 33 wives, even, but, but, but these allegations, even before the so-called polygamy revelation, wouldn't you think that polygamists everywhere would be wise, I mean, just even if there's a question about this, that they would be wise to check out uh, and find... They pay and, a lot of find... money, they pay a lot of time, a lot of energy, and you owe it to yourself. Yes. I know you don't think it's hoil to, to take a look, but you... Give yourself permission to take a look. Exactly. Because, because the evidence is there. I'm not spreading this on. I try to be more cautious than, than uh, well, well, too your paper, liberal about your this. Your paper on the sexual allegations has footnotes. Oh, you got yes. 22 footnotes on your paper. Yes. And you're not making this up. No. And, and ask yourself, audience, look at the approaches that he uses on these women. If you don't say yes, an angel with a drawn sword is going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Intimidation. Or you have, like he said to Nancy Walker, you have uh, 24 hours. Now, he had warmed her up before that, but it's still, do you believe I'm a prophet? Yes. Well, then you have 24 hours to accept this. We gave her a deadline. If the woman, woman was hesitant or a uh, father or a brother intervened, he'd send him on a mission. Mm -hmm. If you say no, I'm going to smear your character. I'm right. going to call you a whore. I'm yeah. sorry, but that's but what he, he did. did. And, and, and chaste. If you say no, you and your family will be damned for eternity. If you say yes, these are six or seven methods he uses. Mm -hmm. If you say yes, you and your family are all saved in the celestial kingdom. Yeah. So he's using yeah. a lot of... But you, does this sound like what Isaiah would use if he were a polygamist or, or Abraham to get people to accept uh, polygamy? Well, you have to ask yourself those questions. And they say that their polygamy is, is based under the Old Testament uh, doctrine, which isn't there of polygamy. And yet there's no Old Testament example of any of the polygamy that Joseph no. Smith lived or today's polygamists. So Joseph Smith is simply driven or um, drives William and Jane Law from the community. Yeah. We have yeah. six or seven testimonies that Joseph Smith tried to assassinate people that yeah. disagreed with yeah. him. Yeah. In fact, he writes in his, William Law writes in his journal the day Joseph Smith is, 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 is murdered, that he is unscrupulous and anybody that he regards as an enemy, your life is in danger. Mm -hmm. And so you have, and their final testimony is that in the last two years of Joseph Smith's life, they said that he broke six of the Ten Commandments, and they list them. Mm -hmm. And he gutted the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And he is the fulfillment of the prophecy of a, of a, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's this right. was their testimony. This is what, this they, is what said. they said. This is what they said. And, and they're and, pretty credible and, people. And he, they knew him. I think William Law is the most credible apostate the church has ever had. He was mm -hmm. in the first presidency of the church. Interesting to read more of his history. Well, we need to um, take a break right now and open up our telephone lines. And our phone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Um, we will um, ask you to turn your TV volume down. And if you don't, then we'll put your call on hold and take the next call. Um, and as we're waiting for the telephone calls to come in, uh, we have a message to share with you. You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. You are welcome to join us in our monthly support group, Life After Polygamy, where you can meet others like yourself who are searching for answers about polygamy and Mormon fundamentalism. 
We meet monthly in the Salt Lake City area. For more details about time and place, call us toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we have made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real-life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, free of charge to you is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. Simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. Welcome back to our show. Um, our telephone lines are open if you'd like to call in and ask uh, Grant Palmer a question. Uh, or make a comment about what we've been talking about tonight. Our number is 801-973-8820. We were talking about the sexual allegations against Joseph Smith. Um, and I would also, again, like to say, if you uh, call in and you don't turn your TV volume down when we pick up the phone, uh, we'll put your call on hold because there's too much feedback and it takes too much time to try and work through that. Um, while we were on our break, you mentioned that we needed to complete the pattern of Joseph Smith and going clear back to 1820 um, up through 27. Did you want to, to uh, address that? Yes, just a couple of minutes. Uh, you see a pattern already with the nine allegations between 27 and pre-Nauvoo, and then you see those same tactics used in, in Nauvoo. So but where we do have documentation and we do have testimony. If Joseph had left off after the nine, he might have been okay, but it just persists and continues on. But I think you can see the pattern in, in two incidents in 1826 and seven. Uh, Joseph is, uh, is found guilty by Albert Neely in 1826 of glass looking. And, uh, and then he's bound over for three justices for a trial. And Joseph has to pay the cost of that trial. It's not a fine, it's the cost of the court. But before they do, they decide to let him go because he's, he was still young and they let him go. All right, so what's more important than that he's found guilty is the testimonies that appear in three trials of Joseph Smith in the 1830s. In fact, the Smith family has a little bit of problems with the law. From 1825 through 30, that six-year period, Hiram, Joseph Sr., and Joseph Jr. are involved in one skirmish with the law a year, six, six times in six years. Mm. And you can read about yeah. that if you want to yeah. get into that. Uh, more important, though, I think, is the question, can Joseph Smith see in his seer stone? the stone that he actually translated, said he translated the whole current Book of Mormon from, yeah. was a stone, not the Urim and Thummim, that was lost, but by this stone, which I happen to have seen, one of the few people have actually seen it in the mm -hmm. First Presidency's vault in Whoa. June of 66. But Joseph is telling people he can see in the stone, see in the stone, but we have five testimonies that he told them he could not see anything in the stone. And Addison Austin in in two trials in 1830 that Joseph's involved with, under oath says he told me uh, that he couldn't see anything uh, wow. in the stone, and I, I do it to make a little 
money here and there. And in your book, by the way, uh, uh, Origins, on page 259, you, you make a shocking statement. And that statement is that Joseph Smith, about him, that there is no evidence that he ever translated a document. With a Urim and Thummim. With a Urim and Thummim. It was never used for that purpose in the Old Testament. If you, if you get all the references. Right, right, it wasn't. Uh, it, it was the... We don't know exactly what they were. They could have been, to make it simple, two quarters. Well, yeah, but it wasn't to translate documents no, from no different languages. No, there's no evidence that it was ever used for translating he, he documents. Never, he never translated. Uh, no credible evidence. And uh, the way this would work is that the high priest wore it in the epaw around his neck, and the priest could go in and get the doc, get the the, uh, the breastplate or the of the, the tribes Urim of Israel and, Thummim, and yeah. the Urim and Thummim. They're two mm -hmm. stones, two something like dice, and you threw them, that, that ask a question, should we go to war here? Or should we, what, you know, those kind of yes and no questions. And if, it, if, if, if the quarters, so to speak, were both tails, that meant no. And if they're both heads, that meant yes. But if one was heads and one was tail, then they'd throw it again. <laughs> That's how that worked. But, but it's not quite the way Joseph Smith used no, it. No, not at all. I even talked to rabbis about this. and they. Yeah. But, but let me just say the other thing that's important is when Emma gets married to Joseph in January of 27, they elope, they come back to Palmyra, and then in the spring probably or early summer, Peter Ingersoll, their neighbor, they get a wagon, Joseph, Emma, and Peter Ingersoll, they go, they go back to uh, her, her father's home, Isaac Hale, to get her furniture and her belongings. And Peter Ingersoll says in his affidavit, I witnessed the most emotional scene. There's, there's Emma's brother, Alva, and there's, there's her father, Isaac, and there's Peter Ingersoll. All three of them, three witnesses, hear this, fine, this testimony. And, and Isaac Hale says, you've taken my daughter and you do, you're in a business that I do not approve of, treasure mm -hmm. hunting. Mm -hmm. But if you'll come here, I'll provide a house for you and we'll find some employment and 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 because you are my son-in-law and so forth and so on joseph breaks down in tears and he says i i have never been able to see in a stone never mm, so he admits he had he admits it to three people and they all do affidavits individually wow so the question is it's a character problem mm. can he see in the stone or can he not He's telling lots of people he can, but he, there's five testimonies mm -hmm. where he says, I cannot. Mm -hmm. And if he cannot, I mean, can you trust him? It comes down to trust. So you put this in, his, in the character mix, plus the, the allegations, sexual allegations of the women pre-Nauvoo, and then you go shift into overdrive in Nauvoo, and you have a very interesting pattern, yeah. and that's the word. And so... Mm -hmm. you, I know you haven't heard this in Sunday school, and you think, well, this can't be true, but you owe it to yourself to take a look. That's, that's, what, that's what we're saying. That, absolutely. And what about the apologetics that explain away the evidence or deny uh, or justify Joseph Smith's activities? I mean, the, 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 many of the people in the Mormon church and also in the polygamy groups will look to those farms and these apologists, and they just kind of spin it. What, well, what they, do you... they don't want anything on Joseph. It's... I, it's Teflon Joseph. Yeah. Nothing sticks. Yeah, yeah. And they can't afford to have him in any way uh, diminished. In fact, the apologists that I'm aware of that are writing right now, they take the position, the premise is that Joseph is totally principled, totally honest, would never tell a lie, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, that's not what we find well, in his much, character through the pattern. There's too much documentation of his lying, even just, just yeah. about polygamy alone. What about the people that are high up in the, the LDS tunnel of power who repeatedly claim that there is no real proof that Joseph Smith's polygamy involved married women and teenagers when the document is... Are they kidding themselves or are they being deceitful? Let's... I don't know, but they're simply wrong. We have Mary... Rollins Leitner uh, speaking at BYU or whatever it was called in mm -hmm. 1905 saying she was a plural yeah, wife and she was married to Adam Leitner. So I don't know how you can get around that. Yeah, I don't either. I don't either. Okay, we have a, an off-the-air question. Uh, and the question is, is Grant a Christian? Has he left the church? And he answers yes to both questions. 
Um, it looks like we have, well, I'm not sure if that call is ready yet on line one. Jerry, on line one, we'll give it a try. Hello, Jerry? Yes. Yes, you're on the air, Jerry. Okay. What's your question? Uh, I would like to know, uh, I'm not too articulate about what you're talking about. It's the first time I've seen your show, and I think it's great. Um, some of the things, the polygamy has been with us throughout history, and I wonder why we're going through this now. I mean, why is this such an issue right now? If Has there ever been a, a place where some authoritarian Christian leader has said this is not going to be anymore, is not allowed, or Jerry, should not would, be permitted in the Bible, Jerry, or would in you, the Book of Mormon, or where has it? Jerry, would you consider um, the, the New Testament as authoritative on that issue? Because in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, it says each man is supposed to have his own wife and each woman is supposed to have her own husband. And if you go in Deuteronomy 17, 17, it says the king is not to multiply wives unto himself. So although polygamy was lived in biblical times, it was never condoned or commanded by God. And the reason that we're doing this is because as Grant Palmer has, has, has talked about so much of Joseph Smith's character was deceitful and was um, involved in sexual problems, would we follow a man who said polygamy was commanded for eternal life? A man who who did these things? And now that my soapbox over, go. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> so, does that answer your question, Jerry? Yes, I think that basically that's what it's done, and I sure appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, hope you still work on that, and good luck. Thank you. I don't know what I'm supposed to work on, but we're working on a script each week, so maybe we'll hit what he needs. Line two, Jody in Spanish Fork. Hello, Jody. Uh, yes, um, I would like to um, ask your guest, it, was Joseph uh, sealed to Emma first or the other wives that he secretly had that she didn't know of in the temple? Um, she wasn't among the first uh, because she was uh, reticent to get involved with polygamy. She breathed hot and cold, and so Joseph withheld the sealing of their eternal marriage for Sometime, I can't remember exactly what, but it was a number of months before. Uh, that, yes. That's really sad because the church portrays that she was the one and only wife. No. And definitely the first seal to me when she was. Well, and, and if she was really, you know, maybe the biggest problem of all is that Joseph never tells his wife that he's practicing polygamy. She has to find that out. Yeah. Do you keep it from your spouse? And then in section 132, he threatens to destroy her if she doesn't accept what God's given him. Yes, and, and that is scriptural. And that's where, awful. See, Emma is, when she wants, Emma, when she wants uh, William Law, because he's such a sweet little man, for her partner, uh, at first Joseph is on board, and then he says, no, you've got to accept all of Joseph, uh, all of the Lord's reportedly speaking, you, Emma, you have to support all of Joseph's wives. You're to cleave under him, him and nobody else. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you will be removed. You will be destroyed. And I can tell you that she interpreted that to mean that she would be killed. And that was yeah. after she had approached William Law to be yes. her. So Joseph That's Smith right. was <laughs> getting See, Joseph Smith <laughs> is approaching, or, or Emma approaches... Uh, Joseph on this question, if you can do it, I can do it. This is on the 23rd of May, 43, and that's Joseph's own personal secretary. He's the one that's responsible for our Nauvoo history mm -hmm. in the LDS Church. So sometime between there and the July 12th, 43 revelation, Joseph is said no. But why has he said no? Because William and Jane Law said no. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's gone. Yeah. So he doesn't know if, if Emma's going to come up with another substitute. So she, he finally comes up with, read it. It's section 132, verses 51 through 54. And it says right in there, he threatens her life yeah. if she doesn't comply. And she complains to William Law, it looks like I have to comply because uh, otherwise he's going to kill me. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a threat. Uh, did that answer your call, Jody? 
Yes, it does. Thank you so much for the work both of you do. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And, you know, that's one of the things that um, the polygamist groups today, I've mentioned this on the show several times, it comes up quite frequently, but the polygamy groups, when the girls especially are raised from the cradle on um, polygamy, they will be destroyed. That if they do not practice polygamy, they are threatened with the same thing that Joseph Smith threatened them. Well, they're you just doing what, what Nauvoo, the more we find out about Nauvoo polygamy, frankly, the worse it becomes. It does. We still don't. It no. does. And, and these apologists, frankly, are in a leaky canoe and they can't paddle ashore fast enough. <laughs> and, and, then, and so it's cover after cover up after cover up. Well, next week we are going to attack the treason issue with Joseph Smith and, and we're going to bring in some history that maybe um, our viewers haven't heard about before. I guarantee that almost no one has heard what we're going to talk about <laughs> next week. And probably many didn't understand what we we're talking about this week. Well, they take can, a look. They, yeah, take a look. You can easily find it. I would heartily suggest that you buy this book, um, An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, and your book on the, incompar on the Incomparable Christ. Check and check. Incomparable Jesus. Incomparable be Jesus, right. And, um, and also, you can check the Internet, and there's a lot of good places to find information. So we'll see you again next week, Grant. Thank you so very much. And I, my closing comments, uh, people often wonder why we talk about Jesus so much. After all, Christianity does focus more on Him than on any other person or event, and is the only religion that actually focuses on Jesus Christ. First, Christianity was developed from and because of Jesus. Without Him, there would be no Christianity, and a true Christian would certainly desire to know about more about Christ after whom their belief is named. Next, we need to take an honest look at ourselves. We know that we are each sinners, and sinners are in big trouble with a perfect and holy God who hates sin but loves us. Therefore, sinners need a Savior, and because God does love us, He provided a Savior for each of us, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who lived a perfect and holy life, and He paid the price for every single sin that every single human what would ever commit. Without Jesus, there's no salvation. There's no eternal life. There's no forgiveness. Without Him, there's no moral relevancy. There's no true love demonstrated without Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who could possibly keep sinners out of hell. And He didn't have to do what He did on the cross. He did it because God is love. He did it even knowing that most people would reject Him and try to earn eternal life by their own self-righteous works. Jesus Christ is God, and without His love, His mercy, and His patience, he, we all would be doomed. So, of course, we talk about Jesus because he, He's keeping us out of, uh, out of having to pay our own debt for our own sins forever. So, Christians love and exalt Jesus Christ because there is no one else who is worthy to be exalted, to sing praises to, or to preach about. We do pray that each of our viewers would learn more about the true Jesus and surrender your hearts and your lives to him and to him only. See you next week. Good night.